Hi, everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Clear Descent podcast. I'm your host, Roel Dionisio, and I'm here with two great individuals. We have Joel Crane and UC Kivanimi from Hamina, and we're going to talk about building Hamina, what it takes to, to do that, make pro, uh, features and products to deliver, you know, just kind of get an inside look of how Hamina is from these two perspectives here. And, and I think it's going to be an interesting discussion to to really understand as we're, we're engineers and we like to you know, tinker and understand how things work, maybe we can really understand how Humino works from a browser because we're used to using other tools. I think for me, using it in a browser is pretty new. So why don't you guys introduce yourselves? You see, I'll let you go first. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Rovell, for, uh, for having us on. My name is Jussi. I am the wireless janitor at uh, Hamina Wireless. Glad to be on. Thanks, man. Thanks for being here. Hey, everyone. My name is Joel, and uh, I'm the resident American at Hamina. I help you see with product stuff and answer emails and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Great. Thanks to have you here, Joel. And um what I do want to say is we will be giving out two licenses to Hamina. So hang hang in there. Uh watch the episode. We'll tell you how to how to get those. Um, but first, why don't we talk about Hamina? You see, I'll let you take it off uh from here. Uh tell us more. Yeah, thanks, Rowell. Um, uh, in fact, uh if you haven't watched an earlier episode of Clear to Send, I don't remember the number, maybe 136 or something like that. We actually did an episode of a prototype version of Hamina way, way back in the day, like seven months ago. And quite a bit, uh, you, you know, has happened since seven months ago. And it would be great to talk about today, like, like the difference between a prototype and a product. We'll, of course, go through all the additions we've added, all the quirks and features of the, of the product, that kind of stuff. But also, like, uh, you, you know, how do you transition from that flashy prototype into an actual product? Okay, yeah. So that was episode 286. And um, Gee, we were talking wow. about predictive surveys. And I think... Even I thought that was already beta, but you're saying that was even before a beta and we're much, you're, you're much further along is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. I don't, well, alpha, beta, prototype, whatever you call it. All I, if I recall right, that was pretty soon after WLPC and maybe it's, it's kind of the humble fin in me or something, but the, the way I felt about the product at that point is like, barely stayed together for the you know for the demo and stuff like that and and there was like a long way to go to make a product and uh, and also like right when we thought okay now the product is there we we can actually we dare call it 1.0 uh and you know they, then our beta and alpha customers started shouting like you can't do that you don't have reporting yet and reporting is like the most important thing in the tool so so we kind of backtracked and delayed the release by a couple of months to add in reporting and we should take a look at that today as well uh okay. we we are excited about it we think it came like very different very good uh but yeah yeah so so there were there was certainly that okay. uh but i mean there was also like a gazillion, like 20 or something features, added things like that. But I think like, what do you think, Joel? What what to you uh, is the difference between like a prototype and uh, a productized product? I think the, the main difference is something you can use every day for your work or for your life. Whereas a prototype sells you on the idea and, and tells you like whether, okay, you know, is, is can you do like a predictive modeling tool for Wi-Fi and private cellular in a web browser, you know, that to me, that's a prototype. And a prototype is also something you can rapidly change. Like, for example, if you have users that get stuck in a certain spot all the time, like they don't know how to draw a wall or something like that, then when it's in the prototype change, you can make those changes. But as soon as you flip it over to being like a product, well, now you kind of have to be a little bit more careful about the changes that you make, because now people are getting established in their, their workflows. So to me, that's the two main differences. And, and it's interesting because now that it's browser based, when you say you're making changes, are those instant changes that people see while they're in the browser? They don't have to refresh, download a new version of the of Hamina. 
all, all you would need to do is refresh the browser. Uh, okay. That's that's all there's to it. Uh, and I mean, we deploy to production a couple of times a week, I think, right right now. So so the updates are are pretty frequent. Sometimes there's you know one update a week. Sometimes there's three. Uh, kind of depends depends on the week. But yeah, it's um, it's pretty rapid, pretty flexible, uh, and we have different like how how it works for us is. Of course, the uh, developers have the whole thing running on their own machines locally. But then once they're done and once the code has been peer reviewed, so so everybody, you, you know, somebody looks at, uh, every time somebody makes a new feature, somebody else looks at the entire code and, and you know, then they improve it together, stuff like that. And once that is peer reviewed, that's pushed to our, what's called our test instance. And that's Hamina only. So, so you know, we can internally use uh, the feature for X period of time. So let's say Joel, as the owner of the feature, uh, would go through the feature, see that it works according to the spec, see that it works with, you know, different kind of projects, stuff like that. And then once we feel like it's really, really ready uh, for prime time, we've all, all kind of used it for a, for a week or two, then we're ready to push uh, push that feature along maybe with a couple of other features uh, into what's called production. And our production has like two different instances at the moment. One is in the EU and one is in the US and those are completely uh, sealed from one another. But essentially one press of a button deploys the whole thing in, into both EU and US. So, so yeah, production deployment essentially is, you know, check what you want to include and click a button i'm oversimplifying and i um, i never do that but that's uh kind of kind of how, how straightforward that is but that precedes like a lot of like peer review uh, like coding peer review uh you know qa all of that kind of stuff and how, how do you receive feedback from the actual users themselves i'm sure someone will test yeah it we in don't way you've never we, tested it <laughs> We we don't nah. yeah feedbacks yeah. for losers we, no we ignore yeah. everything yeah yeah you know you know shut down the phone uh put the phone to do Go not on disturb vacation and after be you happy push with a what major you got. release okay <laughs> exactly because yeah. you know in Finland we like the work life balance and by that we mean ninety nine percent life one percent work no uh so so actually we get. We get a ton of feedback. Uh, we we accidentally left open our Slack. Like we had this beta alpha tester Slack channel where you roll well you are as well. I think I believe and and uh, we kind of left that open as well. So people are like, uh, you know, some people are communicating there. We have feature upvote, which is like you know a feedback channel, a web browser based feedback channel. Uh, if you want to get involved in the in the beta testing of that, just contact Joel at Hamina.com. Uh, his phone number is plus one three. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so, so we have that. Uh, we have e emails, plenty of emails coming in, Twitter, LinkedIn. I kid you not, all of these channels. Plus, an example from yesterday, uh, we do this user testing quite a bit so yesterday uh we took a network engineer who was not a wireless engineer but he was a network engineer and gave him the tool and said start using it make a wi-fi design and then there was five people myself included from our product team our like me our product designer and a, and a few software developers and we just followed him on zoom as he navigated through the ui and he verbalized his thoughts as he went through the ui and kind of kind of like i wonder uh, how how i can do this and then he tries to use the ui stuff like that then we take notes uh like i have 20 pages of of notes of that meeting i kid you not okay that was large handwriting but still and then we kind of go back and say okay this is where he got seriously stuck we should change that this is where he got confused with this and that feature we should you, you know consider uh, you, you know fine tuning things so so we do a lot of this user testing uh stuff if you want to you know get a good primer on user testing don't make me think is a, is a great book to uh to read okay yeah that's that's a good one and i think that's a great way to test and because especially with a network engineer who has no or their focus is not in in Wi-Fi. You really get to understand how they think, right? Versus other like maybe a CWE might think differently of how they use that feature. And plus, they would know that if they see that tool, like this is I know what this does. Um, exactly. So yeah, you get you get high in the spectrum, low in the spectrum, and then you kind of meet in the middle with a feature that works for everybody. 
or, or a general feature for Absolutely. everybody? Absolutely. And Joel kind of has done this extensively, what we call product training, but it's really half training, has half user testing, uh, right? Joel, you want to describe that, what you do with many of the customers? Yeah, what, one way that we do training is, uh, there, there's basically two ways, like some, like sometimes you can just demo something for somebody. And I think that's fine that you can kind of like get a lot of points across really fast doing that. But I think a way better way to train people is to have them share their screen and then you talk them through it. And that's where like the annotation tool in whatever video conferencing app that you're using is so, so nice because you could draw a circle like, hey, here's what you're looking for. Um, but that's great because you can not you can kind of do a hybrid of like, OK, here's how to use it. You can train people how to use it simultaneously while watching to see where they fumble on things like you could say, OK, hey, click the click the draw walls tool. And then they're like hunting around, like, where's the draw walls tool. And that's like, okay, they're having trouble finding that. And it's so easy for somebody like me that, you know, I've got a lot, a lot, a ton of hours using the tool. Now it's very easy for me. I'm just very reflexive to know where that is. But when you watch somebody else use it, that tells you that it, it kind of helps you understand how cluttered the screen can be and, and how difficult it is to find things sometimes. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and really watching how people use it, you get a, you get in a, a very great, great idea of the workflow people do, or even their mindset, their thought process of, I want to do one thing, here's how I'm going to go look for it. And, and I, I do that with, um, like, it's like troubleshooting with, with end users, right? You're, you tell them to do something and you're watching them. But in my mind, I'm like, I, I know you just need to go over here, click here, but your mouse is going all over the place. And so it's just guiding them or understanding how they look for certain f features or uh, buttons and, and then just making it more efficient for them to use, right, in, in the application. Yep, exactly. So, so when you're so. building the, when you're building Hamina then, how, how, do you, how do you guys select which feature you're going to do next? That's so. That's a really, really good question. And like when we were initially building it, there couldn't be like a, a solidified roadmap or, or we had one, but that was crapped like uh, 10, 10 or 20 times. The, the dialogue with users kind of drives that quite a bit. So, so we get feedback and, and, you know, certain things just pop up all the time so 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 and then when you ask more and more questions you kind of get get the problem more refined and then you find like okay here's uh here's actually how this feature could be built or or here's how we could help the customers even better than anybody has before and stuff like that but the dialogue is kind of the key to to prioritization and granted the loudest customers get there get to the you, you know they get an unfair uh priority uh advantage there but that's all right that's all right usually they are I, also I the most loyal life. and <laughs> and most verbal yeah exactly exactly <laughs> but, it's like uh, that with troubleshooting you know loudest person talks to somebody at the highest level of the hierarchy there and then somebody that talks down or says hey Right, Joel, you probably get that from EC, right? Like, hey, you should work on this all the time. Man, <laughs> no, no. Another way that we can prioritize what features go in is we have our feature upvote board, which is it's it's like I mean, you've all everybody's used like um, some kind of feature request and upvoting tool. That's what this is. And a, a lot of times people will come to me and be like, "Hey, Joel, I'm really interested in this feature," and I will either distill that down for them and go put it in on the board on their on their behalf or i'll just send them over there and be like you know what they can they can write down way better than i possibly could so like why don't you go put it in over here and then other people can get in there and upvote that that's really helpful and we don't that's kind of a beta thing that we're doing right now we don't have it um opened up to everybody but like you said if you want to get in just get in touch with me at joel at hamina.com and i'll get you in there but that is super super useful because we regularly see ideas and there's stuff we hadn't even thought of that seem like a great fit for Hamina. And we also can see how interested people are in certain features. So there's a lot of features in there that only have one upvote from the person that submitted it. And that's fine. But then there's a lot of stuff in there that's got lots and lots of interest. And it's like, okay, yeah, that definitely needs to get prioritized. We need to do that sooner rather than later. What's a surprising feature to you guys that you maybe thought, oh, this is not something anyone wants, but then it shoots up to the top of the list. 
one such feature was definitely switching cabling. Uh, like I, that was definitely not going to happen for 1.0 or even 2.0. However, our, I don't, I don't know about our version numbering. We don't have such, but, but anyway, it was definitely not going to make it to the first version, but then everybody was asking for it, literally almost everybody. And then within that feature, like within our cabling and, 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 you know, switching, uh, drawing manually the cable routes or defining the cable routes manually uh, was 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 a surprise. Uh, we were like, nobody's going to use this for actual real cable planning, and then it turns out everybody was asking for it, for that feature. So that kind of that kind of things uh, for sure. Yeah, and I remember when you demoed these uh, application, even knowing you know how how much POE budget you'll need, drawing a cable to a switch. And understanding like, oh, the switch model I plan to use won't have enough PoE for all the APs I plan to deploy. And I thought that was pretty cool as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. The PoE with Wi-Fi 6C has been a great, uh, great saver. And when we talk about prioritization, I'm just sharing my screen here. Uh, one thing uh, how, how these things could be looked at, some people look at like urgency on one one axis and importance on one axis i'm i'm not that detailed i don't understand that but you you could or like what i mean is is i i'm just not that smart so uh the way i probably look at that is something like you know importance slash urgency and on the other uh hand we have workload so some features are hugely important, but they don't take a lot of workload. This could be like critical bug fixes. Uh, it's not a feature, but but yeah, critical bug fixes that are easy to fix would be probably here. And then, you know, highly important, but also a lot of work. This would be like, you, you, you know, so, something like reporting system uh, for, the, for the product. And, and almost up there uh, is, is like, uh, you, you know, PDF, reporting or 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 things like that like paper reporting in addition to web-based reporting which is kind of our our crown jewel and then uh i don't know what would be like not important but a lot of work uh i don't want to this uh, this anybody's feature request but some things are like you know maybe they're important for one customer uh but this axis uh the the x-axis here also like would need to mean that it's important for many customers not just for one but if it's only important for one single customer and it's a lot of work then it's a lot less likely to yeah, be you probably have those be. corner use cases where it's a specific workflow to that individual or that company but it won't benefit the 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 greater users that are on this platform exactly exactly so you want to, uh, ideally uh you you would get you know these guys uh, the, these would get the preference and then uh, it kind of radiates from there. Is, yeah, because uh, if, if it's highly important, and urgent, but the workload or, or yeah the workload is small, you can you can batch those processes, get them out faster, and sooner, and then start really doing deep work on the ones that require so much effort. Exactly. exactly. Okay. So internally, you, then, when you talk about the building Hamina and the features, like what is your guys' uh, thought process around? Like you, you pick one of these, all right, this like fix. How do you go about planning it and saying, you know, this is how we're going to do it? Like, what do you guys say internally there? <laughs> hey, Joel, uh, sh should we show, well, uh, one tool that we use for UI specking is brought by Joe brought with Joel uh, to the company, which is called balsamic. Uh, Joel, you may want to uh, find something there if you have a hygienic spec. Uh, meanwhile, uh, and you know, so so let me explain the process first. So 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 first we kind of make a draft or some kind of a sketch, you could say, of the of the feature, like how it works. I like to use like what I'm using now is remarkable. Uh, but but you know, there's a there's a lot of things that could be used. But let's say I was I was speaking out, which is what I was doing today and yesterday, stuff like that, speaking out the multi-floor uh, feature and a kind of floor alignment and, and stuff like that. And this is a sneak preview of, for what's coming on the on our upcoming multi-floor feature. So, you know, maybe we have a button here, uh, you know, maybe we have a multi-floor tool, uh, which then allows you to 
align the floors somehow on top of one another and order them and, and, and stuff like that. And then we, maybe we have some something like, uh, let's say we add also sloped, uh, you know, air, areas that are kind of related. So, so there's like staircases, escalators, stuff like that, like sloped areas that you could draw on the floor plan and, and kind of more sophisticated uh, stuff that's related to, to the you know, vertical, or is it horizontal, vertical architecture of the building. Anyway, so there would be a tool, there would be sub tools, and then, uh, you know, maybe there's one map, and then there's another map that you have to align visually on the on the screen on top of one another uh, to kind of, uh, you know, li line them up properly. This is kind of how we're going to do the, the floor alignment. You actually see two maps on top of one another transparently, and then you then you uh, move them on top of, top of one another. So this would be an example of like sketching a feature out. Uh, and Joel, you want to show uh, Balsamic, how you sketch out things with Balsamic. Yeah, if you want to stop sharing your screen. Yes, you know, doctor. The... Okay, so you're, you're not using like you. balsamic vinegar to draw. <laughs> no, <laughs> that, that would be that would be delicious uh, on a nice salad. But no, so so yeah, this is a uh, this is a tool. Actually, this was introduced to me by Ryan Woodings at MetaGeek. So I, I credit Ryan for this. This is uh, balsamic mockups, and it's a web based tool. And it's inexpensive and, you know, that kind of fits along with, uh, with how we do things at Hamino, which I like, but, uh, but basically it's a rapid prototyping tool. Um, so you can drop in things like, you know, this is like a generic web browser window. This is like a floor or this, this is like a, a drop down menu. So, you know, you could grab a combo box and stick a combo box over here and then you can, you know, add stuff to it. And, uh, and basically this allows you to do really, really rapid prototyping. And then you can see like this little button right here, that's got that little, that little shortcut arrow that actually will take you to a different mock-up screen. So you can basically stitch all these different screens together. And then you can even share a link with a, a user or somebody who's testing the product and you can have them click through this and you can watch them use it over zoom. And this is great because the developers have to do zero effort here. There's no work on the developer's part, but you can rapidly proto uh, prototype things and test things without having to spend any development time. So yeah, I, I really enjoy using this tool. And you see, what do you think of balsamic mockups? Do you, do you like this tool? Dude, I like it a lot. And actually what you're showing, it's so easy to use, what you're showing the multi-floor view. Uh, I, I, I literally did that while at the conference. So I just went out to the sidelines of the conference and, and you know, an hour of balsamic and you have a working prototype of, of like how the multi-floor feature would work. And you can navigate clicking on a menu item. It actually navigates from one place to the next and stuff like that. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for bringing it, uh, you know, to the company, Joel. So it's almost well, as it, if you're building it, it's a mock-up, but you, you get an understanding of clicking through what it could possibly look like. And and right away when you're showing it to your user, they're able to go, no, that's not what I'm talking about. And so if they elaborate more, you can just change it instantly and then get the feedback right away. So the the time to even improve your application is shortened and, um, that's how you're able to deploy updates faster and yeah, actually get that's definitely it in a way that the user, the users want. Yeah, that's definitely part of it. And I, I think that rapid prototyping phase is really important because it just doesn't take, it takes no time. And even balsamic, they encourage you to be like fast. They're like, don't make everything pixel perfect. Don't align everything. You you can, but but they really encourage you to not do that, which I think is a great, it's great guidance on their part. Um, even like the guy that designed the original, the, the original iPhone keyboard, which that was a huge challenge, by the way, like that was not easy to design a touch keyboard for the iPhone. It seems so easy now. Ken, I feel like his last name is Cassianda, but I think I'm, I'm mispronouncing his last name. I just don't remember how it's pronounced, but, uh, but even he tweeted a, a couple of weeks ago that like PowerPoint and keynote are totally acceptable ways to prototype a product. And I thought that was really cool that like the guy that designed the iPhone keyboard for the original iPhone is like, yeah, just be quick, like whatever's fast, whatever you can make sort of interactive. It could just be some generic shapes and stuff. That's enough to do a prototype. I totally agree. And I mean, uh, there you have it, our UX designer who always gives me a hard time for using PowerPoint extensively, because that's kind of what I know for quickly resizing images and, and you know, uh, 
mucking mucking things up. Uh, I've I've moved that much of that to Balsamic, but at times PowerPoint is still the way to go. Yeah, it looks like a very powerful tool, and and being able to just show functionality and user experience, right, is is what you, what the goal is to get from prototype to an actual product. Absolutely, so that- absolutely. And uh, let me share my screen again if that's okay so yeah we were at draft right uh so next up this draft is then uh you know we we ring up our absolutely magician uh ux designer who you know is lying in his hammock uh somewhere in spain because because you know he lives the good life and I'm- he's not joking he's probably in a hammock in spain right now well not not right now but you know no, actually, right now, yes, <laughs> exactly. So, so he has his laptop here, and and uh, so, so, you know, he's he's in Finland every now and then, but mostly he's just you know wherever he wants. And anyway, uh, so, so we we ring him up and say, hey, here's the draft. Uh, we we do a screen share. We show show like what it's all about, and then this guy starts working his magic in his hammock and the. He, he uses a tool called Figma. So we used, uh, let's say, Balsamic, PowerPoint, uh, you, you know, whatever here. He uses a tool called Figma. And then, uh, you know, that turns stuff already into pixel perfect. So he actually, you know, this is a web browser based tool, kind of like Hamina, but for UX design. So so this is what he does based on like uh, the ugly ugly drawings and, and PowerPoints and, and balsamics and stuff. This is what it will start looking like. And this is where you can actually see like, yeah, now you can actually adjust ceiling height and attenuation of the floor. And, and you know, you can reorder the fro- floors because there's handles uh, in there that allows you to do that. Uh, and y- you can see even unfinished stuff here, like uh, he hasn't done the icons yet. So, so you know, uh, those are still question marks and stuff like that. And this is also a prototyping tool in a sense that you can click stuff and it will it, it will take you forward, backwards. Sometimes he does videos of prototypes, like a video of how the UX would work. Okay, so that's uh, yeah, that's interesting. That's uh, that's where it becomes pixel perfect, and then uh, k- kind of the coding starts to happen, and that's uh, you know both back end so on the on the cloud side uh and front end on the on the kind of browser browser yeah. side of things Th- this and, is and the it. phase that i have with where i see from tv shows and movies where someone has a, this is what i want it to look like then they hand it to the coders and they're like what the heck <laughs> <laughs> how are we gonna do this <laughs> and it's funny the coders all work in a really dark room with like blue shadowy lights everywhere and yeah know, hoodies on like in a dungeon yep. or something <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly um one thing too about the uh kind of the figma like the, the hi-fi prototyping stage is sometimes what i'll call it uh is that our ux designer has gone through and he's created like a whole system of ui components that already exist like here's what a warning label looks like here's what the text should look like in like just a combo box here's what buttons should look like and so he's kind of got all of these different puzzle pieces that he can just all these kind of they're like lego bricks that all work together that he can go grab and place into things and so he can take our really quick really just messy uh, uh, prototype. And then he can turn it into that hi-fi prototype and show exactly what it's going to look like. And then the developers can all use that as a reference when they're building it into the actual product. So there's a lot of moving pieces to even just building a feature. You're using a lot of different prototype or apps that help prototype what the product will look like. And then more user testing. And then finally, what what is it like to to make it to that final phase right before you push that production button? That's, that's a really good question. Let me share my screen again. And now now this is where we go outside of my uh, comfort zone, but, but essentially we had this coding thing here, uh, front and back end, and then both are pushed and there's there's some other you know we we've split it up more than just front end and back end but essentially uh both of these are then pushed uh first into what we call hamina test 
and then uh, me and Joel and and everybody else is kind of like you know go, going through uh, test testing it, and then once it's seen good enough, then it's also pushed to you know US and EU. And what's what's essential about coding? What I left out here is before uh, this is pushed into test, uh, and all of this code li lives in GitHub typically, right? So. So uh, they what they do is they actually do a pull request uh, to, to GitHub. So they push the code in there and then there's a peer review. So somebody else looks at each and every line of the, the other person's code. They improve it together, like I said, said earlier. And then once uh, all of those, uh, you know, changes, improvements have been made, only then is it pushed to test. And usually even after pushing to test me, Joel, or somebody else finds, you know, something that needs to be fine tuned. And then eventually it, it ends up in the cloud uh, or in the production cloud instances. Or did I put it right, Joel, more or less? I think, yeah, I think that's absolutely perfect. So yeah, I think that the review part is really important. Basically every single line of code that gets written gets multiple eyes on it before it goes to production. And sometimes I think a developer will look at it and go like, yeah, that looks great. And they approve the pull request. Other times they might look at it and go, you know, I think I, there's a couple things here that I think we can probably, you know, if we get a few more eyes on this, we might be able to neaten this up a little bit or make this slightly more efficient or whatever, and then they'll collaborate on it. So it's really fun to watch. I, I enjoy watching that process unfold. Absolutely. Yeah, I haven't been in the process myself, but, you know, you make it look so easy just diagramming this here, drawing it up. <laughs> yeah, but uh, let's let's be honest. We're we're the talking heads here. Uh, Joel has done this much more than I have. Uh, but it's it's really the guys on the other room that I'm point, pointing to uh, that have you know made all this happen. So there's a lot of work I think that goes to like setting up everything so that it actually works really really nicely. And there's so much more that comes to this. For example, we use a tool called. I don't even want to, uh, well, we use different kinds of tools for, for uh, I, I might say it wrong. We, for example, we have a tool that compares like how did the UI look before and after this feature was added. And if there's unintentional changes in the UI, actually the, the developer reviews like before and after everything in the UI. So it looks at the differences in UI automatically. Runs, runs the entire UI, looks at the differences that the system does. And then the coder is told like, this looks different, this looks different, this looks different. And then he can say, oh shoot, that was unintentional. I didn't mean that to look different because of this change. And then they can change things around. The other uh, thing that I've been really excited about is we also use a system, since this is a cloud-based tool, right? So, so uh, what what happens is is uh, you know sometimes bugs are caught uh, before anybody even realizes it. That's that's the beauty beauty of of a cloud based system. So so some some alert bell goes off and says, hey, uh, there's there's actually seems to be a problem here. Somebody look at that. Uh, nobody reported it, but the system itself reported it. It it sounds like almost magical, especially coming from desktop apps, which could never ever do that. But it just we've fixed so many bugs without anybody reporting uh you know those bugs to us it's to me it was like i couldn't believe it but it's yeah it's real yeah and i think that's what's so great about cloud cloud-based applications is being able to catch things quickly and you know make it better without having the users waiting you know months weeks who knows how long right until until it gets fixed because there, there's some things that some bugs are so bad where you're, where you're just going, well, I need to fix the, I need this fixed right away so I can complete my job, but I'm at the mercy of, you know, the code and when that gets released and there's a, there, some companies have very strict release schedules where they won't push a certain update after pushing their latest update, they got to wait for the next cycle. So I guess being with cloud base, you, you could be a little bit more flexible that way. Absolutely. And you have experience on that role, right? You've used uh, cloud-based infrastructure and things like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. I've used cloud-based apps and I prefer to use cloud-based apps just because of that. Um, something can go wrong, but I know that if I see it and multiple people see it, then the vendor can go ahead and fix that 
instantly without me having to download the latest release that just gets fixed within a few hours. So, I mean, that's unfortunately, I, I find it like a blessing and a curse, right? Cause for one thing on my end, I have work to do. I have to wait, but then on your end developers, they might be done for the day. And then all of a sudden they got to like fix something within a few hours because we know it's possible. Right. So <laughs> it, it's just, it's like you're either working or you're not working and then you got to hop out of bed to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> not that we ever have any situations like that, Joe. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, definitely not literally yesterday. Something was <laughs> broken for a customer and VLA was working on it at like midnight Helsinki time. Yeah. That never happens, especially not yesterday. <laughs> yeah. I and mean, that's way, how it is yeah. now in cloud, right? <laughs> yeah. It it's is, but it's, but it's also like, um, you know, it liberates the employees work whenever they want. Cause, and we've been blessed with the fact that we have employees who, who might take breaks during the day, but then they continue in the evening, which is great because that's when the U S customers are up anyway. So, so, you know, they might do things yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, things that's like the one that didn't of, happen yesterday. That's another aspect of building Hamina that no one, no one really talks about the culture and, you know, you're not, no one is just working 24 seven, right? You're, you guys have this flexibility, like you said, where during the day, maybe I'm not going to do any work, but I am kind of like this night owl. I'll, that's when I'll start doing a lot of work. That's when I'm more efficient, right? And for some of us, if you have family or kids during the day, like it, it's difficult to do work during that time, right? Um, they're constantly bothering you and you gotta tend to their needs. Uh, but if you have the flexibility of just, you know, let me just wake up at eight or be awake at 8 PM and then apply some you know, work. And like you said, it's going to be daytime in the U S and we'll benefit from that. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think overall efficiency wise, if you take breaks during the day and you actually don't think about work for, for, for a while, it just, you know, unlocks, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of the mental, mental, uh, you know, change that you, you've you had yeah. with, you know, yeah, developing especially if you can get already. away from your desk, walk outside, go ride a bike or something to change scenery. Um, although for you, for you in Finland, it might be diff difficult right now to, to do that, but <laughs> <laughs> look out the window, I guess, with your tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look at the darkness, get more miserable, <laughs> continue coding. That's, that's how we roll. <laughs> But, but yeah, uh, yeah, you're yeah, not doing your uh, U.S. tours anymore, huh? During the winter. <laughs> I, well, I mean, uh, given given that everything is remote, it's uh, it's a lot easier. Um, but yeah, you don't you don't get to enjoy the California sunshine as much. <laughs> but well, what what else are we missing that you want to tell the users about building Hamina? Like, what what should they know, or do you want to show off any other features that you think should be shown off since the last time we recorded? Yeah, maybe maybe we should. Uh, we should also, uh, and also a shameless advertisement, we will be talking more about this uh, also at our WLPC deep dive. All Everything has been sold out, I'm sure, already. But if you if you send an email to Keith R. Parsons and cry your eyes out, maybe he'll have a ticket for you. But uh, so, so on our deep dive in Phoenix, uh, we will be talking more. You, we will train people to use Hamina. They will get certified. But we will also uh, be talking a lot about how the product is built and go more in depth with with what you you know what you saw here. Uh, so so that's one thing. And I also I think I have a speaker slot uh, of twenty minutes of like how these products are built. So so uh, we'll also go deeper deeper then. But let's take a look at the product quickly if you if that's okay and uh, you know see what we've added. Yeah, let's do it. Am I sharing and, my screen? I guess and, I'm not. And, and while you're doing that, just to let the listeners know there is video, if you haven't, if you couldn't tell, uh, couldn't tell from us speaking, but if you want to see the visualizations, you, you could head over to our YouTube channel to view that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, let's quickly create a new project and we'll talk through the stuff that was added since uh, February at the same time. So, so just to show off some, you know, most of the features, we're going to design a warehouse of R Rovellino uh, and we'll put that as a warehouse. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> 
You're that's a city. Home. That's a city in California, right? That's <laughs> it, it, precisely. Uh, so, so I'm just going to drag and drop a JPEG. Uh, last time we looked at the automatic wall detection from CAD files, uh, from PDFs. We can also extract the walls automatically from crappy PDFs like this one. Uh, can I say crappy on, on air? I, I I don't know. Uh, so <laughs> from from uh, from PDFs, we don't. Or sorry, from JPEGs like this, uh, it would be kind of hard. So. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, draw the walls manually by hand, and then we're going to define some of the shelves and things like that uh, as well. So first, we're going to draw the walls. And just like uh, we had before, hit C for concrete, for example, and we're going to do the concrete walls here, uh, pan the map a little bit this way. Here we go. And then for, for the windows, we could just hit W, uh, C, yeah, I like w, how quick you can do that with C. keyboard shortcuts. Yeah, and man, it's... show it there on the on the right side. Yeah, of it, all it the just... features in Hamina that people love. When I demo yeah, this, like I've gotten literal applause several times because of that feature. It's pretty great. Yeah, even because even drawing it out, it can take a long time. But if you if if you per, if you save me clicks, that's gonna be a, a big plus right there. Absolutely. And the way like I drew this wall first here and, and the, you know, the way it snaps, uh, snaps now automatically exactly to where that wall ends. And, you know, little things like that really do make a difference. Uh, so. All right, we're, we're almost done with, with the yeah, whole thing. You've uh, already outlined that pretty quick. Usually. Yeah. Yeah. Usually I'd be sitting here for a while, just. <laughs> contemplating why why i do this <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly and Roel, exactly. as a as a network engineer like how much does drawing walls on maps bother you like oh, is this something that does I, it I, does it bother you or do you just do it and it's like not a big deal it bothers me like really sometimes i'll delay things just because i don't want to draw a wall <laughs> <laughs> that's funny i i kind of like it so just send me your stuff and i'll, I'll i yeah, should I'll be careful that. about I'll saying send that you all the work like, i need done <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> must be i always save you, huh? I, it is and i always save that work until like a friday afternoon when i'm sick of like you know being on zooms all day and answering emails and stuff i always save that for like kind of the mindless like end of day work and yeah, I, I it's just kind of a nice way to unwind drawing walls is not much right you just got to make sure you have the right wall and you're just yeah. it up <laughs> it's like it's just a bunch of clicking it's like playing starcraft or something you know it's just <laughs> click 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 so yeah one thing one thing um i'm showing the wall editor where you can edit all the walls and and all of that so so one thing that we support is the automatic kind of adjustment of atten attenuation depending on frequency so let me uh, let me see if i can uh so, so here we go so so um if we have you know attenuation on y-axis here and then we have uh you know frequency of transmission here uh and and let's say here's 450 megahertz and uh and here's like six gigahertz for example so uh different materials actually behave differently as a function of frequency in terms of db loss so you might have uh i, I don't know concrete that that works like this and then you might have a drywall that works like this and stuff like that so so you know depending on the material the difference between let's say five gigahertz and six gigahertz might might differ and stuff like that so so these are not linear and they they behave slightly differently so we actually modeled all of this in our tool so you by default you set the attenuation what it is at five gigahertz because everybody can find a five gigahertz device to measure the attenuation with. And then you select the material type. And using the material type, we know what the function of dB loss and frequency will be. So we can, you know, tell, okay, since it's this type of a material and it's three dB attenuation at five gigahertz, then it's 3.8 dB attenuation at six gigahertz, for example. It's, uh, you know, things like this need to be accounted for, certainly because we support, you know, for example, for private cellular, we support everything from 500, 450 megahertz upwards, uh, which is a pretty low frequency. So, so we needed to, you know, do do tricks like that uh, into the tool as well. Like, 
and you don't need to measure the uh, what i mean is you don't need to measure the wall at 450 megahertz then 900 megahertz then 2.4 gigahertz then 5 gigahertz and 6 gigahertz no none of that yeah, stuff that's done automatically i'll have to carry to do that <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly we would all like to buy the, all, all of those tools no question about that but we wouldn't want to pay for them anyway uh where was I? We were drawing walls to the warehouse. Now yeah. we have a. So now you're going to do a shelf or something. Right? Now I'm going to do a shelf or something. Exactly. So here we have a 25 foot shelf, which are these. So just click and drag to draw a rectangle here. There we go. And see how it again snaps to the previously drawn points. Yeah, snap, the alignment of, snap. of those is, is neat. Snap. I like that feature because I know when I've, when I've drawn out attenuation areas that's always off when you zoom in it's like oh wait i'm off by exactly <laughs> exactly so what what i'm gonna now do is is i'm gonna take a copy of that and do like a, a 12 foot variant of that 25 foot shelf here we go so because some of the shelves here are lower so i'm just gonna draw those out as well like that i'm doing a terribly sloppy job and of course, these can be edited later, but you get you get the point, right? Yeah, it makes and, sense. And then maybe we do uh, some of the trucks because we don't want to do outdoor coverage and stuff like that. Uh, we want to model the trucks. That's the worst case scenario on the loading docks. All right. And while UC is drawing lots of little squares on the map, uh, notice that the, like the add scale button down the corner has been yelling at him the whole time. Like, <laughs> set yeah, the scale. I set that for a bit. <laughs> I totally <laughs> no, it, didn't. It, Let's well, click on that guy here. That's a great example of like of UX design where I mean I do it all the time. Like I'll get going on a project and forget to set the scale, which is like a very foundational thing for a predictive model. And so our UX designer put a lot of effort into like, okay, how do we get people's attention? So there's like three or four different places in Hamina that it will yell at you and say like, hey, you got to set the scale before this will work or that. It's like work, a gentle which, nudge, like, hey, I'm yeah. still here. Exactly. Yeah. Not too annoying, but still annoying enough to, uh, you, you know, get get your attention. Okay, so so uh, then, uh, so, so uh, what I did is, even even with explaining the whole thing, we modeled the the site in like I, I don't know a couple of minutes, and then uh, we just put the APs here. The heat maps look quite different now right uh i i mean they they were a little bit grainy and stuff in the in the version we showed at cts earlier on but now now they're pretty uh pretty like nice and smooth and all of that and they actually get more and more crisp as you just wait uh for the heat map to, up, to update and of course there's you know a uh, height of the ap down tilt up tilt or all, all of that stuff is here so it's completely three-dimensional the entire model you can see the shelves leaving shadows here the four meter shelves uh you, you know leave less of shadows and these guys of course attenuate more on the right hand side because they were they were eight meters or 25 feet so and this doesn't translate over zoom but it's 50 frames per second kind of and, and see how the trucks yeah. in the in the yard yeah, also it looks really uh, smooth to me okay that's that's kind of cool even though i'm well i am on my super reliable super fast wi-fi but but still uh, there's always the internet but yeah this is uh how you would model it and you know the heat maps were one thing that we were pushing a lot we added things like you know automatically disabling 2.4 gigahertz radios uh and and automatic channel planning all all of that uh you know dual yeah. 5 gigahertz support so it's happening uh, on the fly it's changing channels as you place exactly new access points. as you place new access points so you can see one six eleven in here for example if every time you make a change to the infrastructure it's kind of like rrm every time there's a change to the infrastructure it reruns the entire channeling algorithm to make it perfect of course it's not exactly the same as rrm would be but yeah, it's pretty yeah. damn close i would think and and it's it, it adds more uh, efficiency here as we do it because now i don't have to go back and look at this and go all right how's my channel plan gonna look you've already you know, made the changes, it's probably just minor changes I, I'd be making. Exactly. And this is where you control, uh, you know, the channel width, the available channels, uh, whether you want to, you know, disable all of 2.4 or, or you know, disable 2.4s or, uh, you know, selectively or, or whatever. And same with CBRS, you know, what the, what the channels are and, 
and stuff like that. Uh, then we can, you know, if we don't want to worry about about the channels, we can take it out. There's the usual interference and, and you know, SNR data rate, all of that stuff. And then, of course, you can augment. If you're doing location services, we could take a look at, for example, tertiary coverage. Uh, and let's say we want, ideally, we would like to have three BLE receivers at NEG70, and if not that, then at NEG78 uh, at, at least. So. Uh, we want those three BLE uh, beacons to be audible everywhere or BLE signals to be audible everywhere uh, so, so that we get good location granularity. And we can see in this warehouse, obviously, it doesn't happen uh, very, very well. So we could augment that. And this we also added uh, in, the, in the last couple of months is, you know, BLE uh, beacons and, and this kind of stuff. So we could augment this by placing a few beacons and now we can see we're starting to get the three three signals uh, at neg seventy from BLE as well. So it's not just you know Wi-Fi planning; it's BLE, it's private four G, private five G, uh, all all of that kind of stuff. the The other thing we uh we added was was the uh, out of scope zones. So so you can easily scope out like okay. We, we care about the you know front yard here and the loading dock, but any other areas outside the building, we just even don't want to draw the heat maps there. So you could just you know draw draw a zone there. Or if we don't care about the janitorial closet here, we could exclude that uh, away, and and you know we won't draw a heat map there. And of course, these are a part of the report as well. Speaking of the report, so yeah, a couple of the report. <laughs> couple of things in Hamina. Uh, one thing is sharing with your colleagues, which is essentially, you know, here. I just type Joel's email, send, hit invite. And since Joel is already a Hamina user, if he happens to be using the product at the same time, he will get a notification bell saying, bling, uh, UC has shared a file with you. Do you want to approve? And then it will show up as one of his projects. Okay. And Joel will have, uh, if he has a paid version of Hamina, he can do any, anything he wants. He can even share it forward to, to Rowell, the senior architect. You know, once once us juniors are done with the design, then we'll share it with the senior architect. Oh, that's uh, trouble and... right there. That's trouble. <laughs> <laughs> he he paid, Rowell, he you think he's time. joking. It's coming. We're, we're, you know, as soon as we get into our consultancy business, we're just going to be sending you stuff left and right here. <laughs> Is it like this? Yeah. Now, see if you're not using Hamina with that email, you will get you will just get an email saying, "Hey, hey, uh, this is in Hamina." Then you could sign up, and even if you haven't paid for Hamina, you can still sign up to Hamina, and you can look at the file, you can add notes, uh, you know, you can add coverage or out of scope zones, in scope zones, you can add more maps, things like that for free. Uh, anyone can do that. Actually, anyone can sign up to Hamina and start using the tool, except without any of the useful features for RF planning. So once you need to do placing APs, placing switches, uh, you, you know, all that kind of stuff, that requires a paid version. But anyone in the project team can actually do a limited number of things. This is kind of what we would call the salesman yeah. mode. Without paying anything, you can still start projects. You can put in the maps. You can scope out like where the Wi-Fi needs to go. You can write notes. You can tap notes on the map. That kind yeah, of stuff. For, for me, that's great for sharing it with customers and being able to be very interactive with that design. Exactly. And then there's the um, there's the report generation. So so what we talked about previously for the last two minutes was for the colleagues, right? But the report is typically for the customer, and this is the preview of what the customer would see. And here we can, you know, we get automatically generated bill of materials, including switches, cables, uh, antennas, e everything. And you can edit all of these columns. You can edit like any anything you want. You can name the each of the views separately. You can give descriptions to each of the views. You can look at like, okay, where where did I place the APs? Where are the switches? How how, do, how does it work now? All of that. We can look at the coverage area of the map. We can cycle through different maps if we if we so desire. Uh, cycle through different frequencies. How does it look like on two four versus five? We can zoom in. We can zoom out. Uh, like the the reason I I think this is special is because typically what would you be looking at? You would be looking at a PDF document of like I don't know yeah. thirty or forty pages, which is fine and and that too 
often is a deliverable. But I think this also, from a customer standpoint, this gets the like excitement level of the customer quite a lot up uh, compared to just receiving a PDF. Yeah, document. this is great for um, if, if you're working with other. So for me, I work with closely with the engineers. So if I share this report with them, it's interactive to them. So they they might not like the PDF because it's you know just a just a paper document there. But here they can click, they can really look at things in more detail, and whatever they want to see from that this report here is 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 flexible for them absolutely and i just named the tertiary ble coverage to location tracking coverage gave it a description stuff like that i know everything like switches where are the cables uh where are the security cameras where are the desk phones uh and also like how much cable do you need uh, all, all of this stuff uh, is is there in the in the report as well. And then when you're done with the report with the preview, maybe you want to you know throw drop in a logo as well. And while you know, UC we... is putting a logo in there, I've been since he shared the project with me, which is very dangerous, by the way. Not sure what he was thinking on that, but yeah. I've gone through and I've added some switching stuff. I added POE clients. I nudged a couple of of his APs around. I fixed the little, like the scope zone that he drew. It was kind of crooked at the bottom. Sorry, you see. Uh, but, and so now like you can see all the phones and stuff that I've added. Oh, in, I, I was uh, like, the where design. the heck did they come from? Like, <laughs> that's what I was wondering too. I'm like, how are these things showing up when you see didn't draw them in? <laughs> it's the, uh, our, it's our new auto desk finder. It automatically puts a phone on every desk. Well, careful. Yeah. Someone's going to make a feature request. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Oh man, nicely done, Joel. Nicely done, my friend. Uh, Touche. And um, yeah, then you just click share. Uh, maybe you put a password to it, like you, you know, one, two, three, as as is the uh, you know case. And then you just click, you know send the link out to the customer, and uh, and there you go. Yeah, very cool. I like it. I, I really like it a lot. Even just. I, I'm liking the interactive reporting feature versus just providing a PDF. I think it generates more discussions that way. There's there's a lot of meetings where I talk about the report, I go through it, but no one really says anything, right? They're just sitting there staring at you. They don't really know what it means. Um, showing them individual AP signal strength, just, they just go, okay. But it, they're just scrolling through pages, right? So it yeah, takes exactly. longer that way. Exactly. But yeah, um, like this and like fifty other features we we added since since we last last uh, saw you, man. Yeah, I think that's a that is a lot of work you guys are putting into it. It was just only you know, a few months ago, and then even what you shared at WLPC Prague progress there. So you guys are 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 getting a lot of traction. There's a lot of people who are interested in this, and and I think it's it's great and. That's why even, like I said in the beginning, we want to give away two licenses so you can try it out. Uh, I'm going to create a link. Uh, it's going to be clear to send.net slash Hamina, and that'll take you directly to the show notes page, but there will be a form. So you have to submit the form. This is for anybody who wants to uh, be entered into this raffle. We'll do a raffle uh, and then pick two people who will get a license. That's a pretty uh, pretty cool price, like right there. Uh, let me, uh, in case somebody is looking at like just scrolling through the uh, through the video preview of of this YouTube video, and you know maybe maybe this uh, win free humming. Uh, uh, you, you know this is where where you wanna fast forward your video to uh, win it. Sign up. <laughs> exactly. I mean, they would have had to like be here to hear you say that, but. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if they're just, you know, browsing through the uh, timeline, that's, yeah. that's what I was thinking. It'll, It'll show the little for UC specifically. You know, maybe that's something. There'll be a little is, like there'll be a little spike right there where people skip, yeah. you know, you can <laughs> exactly. see where people usually skip to in the video. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Right. We'll turn it into a clip and then it'll go directly to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can put that at the very beginning of the, oh, like as a teaser. Anyway. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Joel. Uh, Joel. 
uh, and also Rowell as, as the host of the yeah, show. Thank you, show. I mean, uh, and it was fun kind of talking about like how, how this stuff is made as well. Yeah, it's kind of a different perspective of things, right? Rather than just talking strictly Wi-Fi, but also getting to know some of the products that us as engineers use and getting to know how you guys use it, how you get your feedback. And, and I think having that relationship with the customer and the vendor, um, rather than either a customer saying, you know, barking up your tree saying, here's what you need to do or the other way around where a vendor just says, Hey, this is how you're going to do it. I think having that two way conversation is, is important and it instills trust with, and, and reliability with um, you know, the, the tools we use on a daily, right? This is what we do every day. So we as customers rely on tools like yours and having to do it reliably. And that, that's important to me. And, and knowing who's behind it is also, is also great too. And, and we've, we both developed this relationship over a number of years. Like I've, We've had multiple conversations. I've seen each other at every single conference. Like you name it. <laughs> I think a lot of what what you have uh, told me has ended up in the product as well, and and you know all those discussions eventually they mold up into into what now is Famina. So much much yeah, appreciated. And, and a lot of those ideas I get from other people um, in our Slack group. People always say like, "Here's what I'm looking for. Or, Here's why I like this feature." Um, or I'm trying to do this, how can I do that? And that's how it ends up where we say, Hey, you should make that as a feature request. And, and I'm sure it's made it to your uh, feature request board. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And since, you know, with 15 people now creating the product, uh, we really need some kind of a process where there's, you know, you know, the drafting and, and blah, yeah. blah, blah, and, and, you know, prioritization, all, all of that yeah, stuff. You need a structure. Big... Other, it's wild, wild west otherwise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. A little bit, not too much structure, but a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of structure to get, move you forward rather than, you know, you'll have everything as important, but yeah, nothing After gets that, done. It's just all normal stuff, right? <laughs> exactly. Nothing gets done if everything is important. Exactly. Well, where, where can people find you guys if they want to, you know, hit you up, chat with you, find out more? Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of ways. Uh, Hamina.com is our, our uh, website. There's a contact form there, but but also on Twitter, you can find us at Hamina Wireless on Twitter, at Joel, uh, at Potato5 is, is Joel, at Jussi Kiviniemi, that's me, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, plenty of ways in LinkedIn uh, or just Google Jussi Wi-Fi or Google Hamina Wireless or Google Potato Fi. Uh, you, you know, you'll, <laughs> there, there's plenty of ways. And also in the show notes below, right? Yep. Yeah, there's exactly. A direct in link show there. notes, you'll find the form. Sign up if you want to try out Hamina, get a free license. And then, um, you know, let us even know what, what you think about this episode. Any comments you want to you know, share with UC and Joel? Uh, you can all do that on the show notes page down below and, or even in the comments for the YouTube video. But uh, I want to thank you guys for joining me on this episode, sharing um, a lot of insights into how you guys do things at Hamina and being available to, to record. Thanks, man. Much, much appreciated. And uh, thanks to you and Francois for like, you've been so persistent, so much good content. Like every, it oh, feels you. like every freaking week, uh, you know, there's a new episode. It's, and, it's like every other week now, but, but you, you, you guys are really like, I, I don't know how you guys have time for it, but we try. well, well done We're guys. Trying. Well, thanks to you guys even coming on as, uh, you know, guests that, that helps us spread out the episodes where we try to create time to do research. And that takes a lot of work, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's thanks to you guys and also the listeners to joining in and, you know, requesting you know, who they want on the show and then listening to episodes like this. Thanks guys. All right. Thank you guys. Good night.